Too much architecture is never enough. Michael Sorkin writes, exhibits, teaches, designs, and builds. What's the conceptual constant that informs these diverse endeavors? There's experiment in, and wonder that's intrinsic to the architecture adventure. There is social and political purpose that's extrinsic to the architecture adventure. The Sorkin constant is located somewhere between the intrinsic and the extrinsic. There are those who argue that Phidias's Hill of the Acropolis embodies Athenian democracy because the twisting pedestrian route to the hilltop allows passage one citizen at a time. The route of the free individual is asymmetrical. So asymmetry and freedom are an architectural equation. Or are they? There are those who argue that Speer's Nuremberg embodies political dictatorship because audiences are assembled on a colossal scale, balanced row upon balanced row. Numberless individuals symmetrically arranged, responding in mass to an axially, axially positioned speaker is a spatial equation for political tyrants. Or is it? Few contemporary architects have explicitly engaged a discourse that mandates political architecture. Michael Sorkin has entered that list. The architect politico is the poet whose poem is obligated by the political management of social endeavor in space. Our architecture and politics corollary can we measure architecture success in terms of how it confirms a particular social agenda or how it stands as an obstacle to another? Google, de <coughs> Google departs China. Does Tiananmen Square confirm that policy decision? Walls divide Palestine and Israel or the United States and Mexico. Do those walls belong to architecture or to foreign affairs? Is it the courtroom that ratifies the decisions rendered by Chief Justice Roberts? Henry Kissinger, an American Secretary of State, once asked Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai what he thought of the French Revolution. And Zhou responded, I don't know, it's too soon to tell. In what historic time frame are the social and political consequences of architecture to be evaluated? The Louvre was a house for a king. Now it's a museum. Is form deterministic with respect to political purpose? Do progressive politics make progressive architecture? Let's hear the case. Please welcome Michael Sorkin to Zyra. Thank you, Eric, for that uh, unusually stimulating introduction. I hope to answer a few of your questions. Um, uh, yes, and, and one of the things that we will dilate on is the possibility that there are distinctions to be made between the Nuremberg rally, let us say, and um, Woodstock, perhaps. Um, the element that Eric, of course, left, left out in his description of the um, oppressive symmetries of the Zeppelin field at Nuremberg was, of course, that the people gathering there were Nazis, uh, bent on mayhem and world destruction. Um, I think the people gathered at Woodstock had some other purpose in mind. Um, and this is exactly what I would like to talk to you a little bit about tonight. Between extrinsic and intrinsic, why is intrinsic? Uh, well, anyway. Utopia now. I, uh, well, you, you people know that uh, since I am political, I don't like to do product endorsements more often than I have to, but I'm promising you a good two-cup of 
<laughs> the great Satan has many faults that can be laying at his doorstep, but this beverage is not one. Uh, ah. Um, you know, it, it, it gets a little fatiguing to, to begin lectures with images like this. Um, but I think that it is absolutely crucial, in particular in speaking to people who hope to become architects or planetary designers or shapers of space, um, to point out, um, as if we didn't know, um, that the world is going to hell in a handbag. There is a crisis on, um, and we are central collaborators, both in its production um, and potentially in its amelioration. Um, I'm going to go over uh, a, a few uh, factoids, um, just to give myself a little bit of cred, uh, that I think are contributory to this crisis and which we must confront um, in ways large and small every time we pick up um, the equivalent of a pencil. Um, I'm in particular interested in urbanism um, because one of the questions that Eric's uh, generous introduction begged is precisely the location of the political um, within the field of the architectural. And to be sure, um, I think that one of the problems that architecture has had in the last, say, 20 or 30 years um, is a kind of increasing devolution of the sites of its meaning on compasses that are far too small. So my argument um, is a little bit elastic, um, but I dare say that at the larger the scale, which is to say at the scale of the city, the legibility of the political um, becomes greater and greater. Um, what might not be legible, except by some philosophical gymnastics in the doorknob, um, is certainly legible in the arrangement of neighborhoods and streets uh, and classes and incomes and values within the city. So we are confronted uh, with the fact that we are becoming an urban planet. It's only very recently that half of us have come to live in cities. Um, cities are growing exponentially, of uh, whatever, whatever the current number of people on the planet is, 7 billion-ish, um, 3.5 are in cities, and of those, half are living in slums. Um, to me, uh, this begs a question, which I won't answer with any precision, about, um, you know, I, I, I remember after 9-11, um, I was very nearby when it happened, uh, and our building was evacuated, and I walked, I walked home, and it was sort of the end of the day, and it was time to do a little shopping. Um, and I remember my terrible perplexity um, in being forced to choose between a peach and a plum at the greengrocer. Um, a choice that somehow seemed impossible, not simply in terms of the decision, um, but a circumstance that prevented one um, from summoning the appropriate uh, 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 vectors of taste uh, and discernment and preference um, that otherwise might have been um, uh, uncomplicated due to the sunniness of the day uh, and the normality of events. And I think as architects we confront this very much. Uh, if the world is, as I say, going to hell in a handbasket and we are exclusively focused um, on doodads and weird formal experiments, um, where does that leave us politically? Um, I'll give you the answer later, but it's not exactly, I think, the one you think. So, Planet of Slums, um, we, uh, we're all uh, cognizant of Mike Davis's work. Um, this is how a quarter of the people of uh, the planet live. Um, and I think that if we have any credibility, or are to have any credibility as designers and mitigators, um, because what, after all, is the final goal of architecture? It is to bring the maximum amount of happiness um, to the largest number of people. This is a kind of a utilitarian argument, uh, um, you know, a hippie utilitarian argument with all. Um, nevertheless, uh, I, I think that's how we vet our work, you know, not in terms of its weirdness, but in terms of its pleasurability. Um, the environment is collapsing. Um, you know, the news gets worse by the day. You know, our jerk off politicians go to Kyoto and Copenhagen and get absolutely fuck all done. Um, we must do something about this. Um, we must also fight against the title I received in the email, a very nasty letter from Andre Um claiming that I know squat about the New Urbanist Project. But I do know one thing about the New Urbanist Project, and it, it, it all looks the same. 
you know, much like the stormtroopers gathered at Nuremberg in their identical helmets and snazzy retro uniforms, um, we do have something to fear from homogeneity. Um, and that's what our architecture is producing for us. You know, we are the privileged elite. Um, we can have fun, you know, we're going to be the subversives in the office. Um, but the big guys, you know, who are in charge of everything, um, want e things to be the same everywhere. You know, one of the reasons I'm cutting my trip short is that I have somehow have become an extremely supernumerary consultant to the master plan for the growth of Hanoi. Um, and I was delivered a 5,000 page document the other day prepared by Perkins, Schmerkins and Jerkins, <laughs> um, of such banality, of such uniformity, of such 19th century imagining, um, that I was absolutely shocked. You know, I, equally, you know, SOM has done the master plan for Ho Chi Minh City. And I was at a meeting in Vietnam, you know, some, some years ago, and I, and I senior government officials were president. I misspoke slightly, I say, after they showed me the plan, you know, felling with pride. I said, gee, man, um, if SOM is doing the master plan for Ho Chi Minh City, I guess we won the war. Um, scowls all around. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I had the experience today of going to the rent-a-car establishment and get uh, taking my life in, in my hands. They gave me a Toyota, you could see, a kind of group from New York was unaware that this was a death trap. Nevertheless, um, I entered the system uh, for the moment, and uh, it's a terrible system. And you know, the, the Chinese, and you know, I'm doing a lot of work in China, I mean, this is a country that had a beautifully serviceable bicycle culture, um, which they are simply giving up in favor of the idiocy of freeways and motor vehicles. You know, they're, they're currently at about the kind of first World War level in the U.S. in terms of car ownership. Um, but imagine, you know, the disaster that's going to happen when all 1.3 billion of them have a Chevy. Um, you know, we cannot continue to think in terms of transportation systems um, that are designed without reference to the environment, without reference to the morphology of the cities, uh, without reference uh, to the, 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 the kind of communicative aspects of circulation in the cities. And um, Eric's invocation of the walk up the Acropolis, um, I think, was very opposite. Um, accidents, not automobile. But uh, accidental meetings in space, I think, are the bedrock of um, good urban form. Uh, and uh, you know, God save us from environments in which um, surprises are absent. And one of the ways in which we absent ourselves from surprises is sealing ourselves in these pods um, and having no communication with nobody. Um, we're all thinking about Haiti a little bit. And um, it's interesting to watch the, the, the conversation flying back and forth. And um, you know, one worries that the solution, the solution to the problem of Haiti, um, will once again. Um, God, thinking, thinking about Haiti and what to do about it. You, know, you sort of realize um, the inadequacies of your professional training, the kind of you know, your your essential uselessness. I was imagining a couple of weeks ago where I'd be delivered to the uh, tarmac of Port-au-Prince International. Usefully do to be of service to these like sweep up. But uh, um, truly, um, one of the things that I think we must be very careful not to do um, is to persist in the model that global development is essentially a process by which we transfer our techniques and knowledges um, to people who are um, that who are ignorant uh, of the way to do things. Um, I think that we must um, recognize uh, that the, the crisis is being, reviewed, uh, is being viewed exactly in reverse. Um, there is a crisis of underdevelopment, I suppose, but there's also a crisis of overdevelopment. And if we foist you know, the grotesqueries of our houses, cars, and cells um, as a model for, for global progress, um, God help the future of the planet. Um, you all know this uh, ecological footprint concept, right? Is that something that you, a phrase that gets banded around the sire or are you permitted there? Um, uh, it's a useful one, um, and, and I'll make reference to it later. Most of you probably know what it is. It's, it's simply a, um, 
uh, a calculation, uh, kind of a set of algorithms that a couple of Canadian academics came, with, uh, came up with uh, 20 or 30 years ago, in which they propose to convert all kind of inputs and outputs into area. Right? So you convert uh, energy consumption, food, uh, waste, into, into, the, into a, to the amount of surface area of the planet that is required to produce and sustain these things. Um, the numbers are suspicious, they're constantly being modified, everybody has a different model, but conceptually this is an incredibly useful way of doing things. Um, this is a Tom Main student image. So that if you are conjuring with this concept, you suddenly um, um, come up with information like this which is to say that the, the actual area, you know, we tend to think of cities in terms of their morphology, in terms of their political boundaries, in terms of uh, standard metropolitan statistical areas, um, but I think it is vital that we begin to think of cities in terms of the planetary resources that are required to sustain. So in this ecological footprint, this area calculation, what one discovers is that the area required to sustain Los Angeles is the size of Peru. Now, we can extrapolate this. Ah, uh, my favorite example. Um, here's a, what do you call this for? Kiwi? Here is a kiwi. Um, it comes 14,000 miles from New Zealand, and um, every time it does, it produces seven times its weight in greenhouse emissions. Um, this is a problematic calculus. Um, and I think that one, we, one, one that we need to take into consideration of ev at every level of our endeavor. Um, so, here's the upshot. Uh, you know, another familiar calculation, which is that if everybody were, you know, to live like we do in our McMansion with our Hummer, uh, you know, and um, six boxes of breakfast cereal every day, um, if everybody were to live at the American standards, or the Dubai, standards who have surpassed us in the kind of potlatch of consumption. Um, if everybody were to, to eat like we do, it would require the surface area of two additional planets in order to provide the resources. This is crisis, um, and something that I think we have to think about very seriously. I mean, I see Obama has even canceled the space program, so even in the long term, uh, this is not going to be a solution for us, never mind over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Ah, the question of egg. How can we get out of this mess? Well, I, I'm a kind of utopian guy, you know. Uh, I, I remember the 60s with a certain fondness. Uh, you know, the colors were very bright. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the sexual partners were very agreeable and willing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the greens were all pass fail. Um, uh, yeah, but Utopia, unfortunately, uh, another man with a globe. Um, Utopia, unfortunately, has come in for something of a bad rap since the end of the Second World War, um, and understandably so. You know, for the whole generation of thinkers who, who grew out of that experience, you know, on our ends of, of, of the world, um, Utopia was tarred as the inevitable omega point of any kind of idealistic line of thinking. That the, um, the, you know, the last stop on the train to utopia for these people was always Auschwitz. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've done our contribution to, to modeling the dystopian future. You know, whether it's the kind of high modernist Victor uh, Adieres, or the kind of dystopianism of, uh, of Blade Runner, um, you know, it is, it is perplexing, and I, and I raise this in the sense that, um, um, you know, I, 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 other people have written about this more elusively than I, and, you know, there's a bit of a utopian revival of you know, David Harvey and uh, uh, a, variety, a variety of others who are sort of neo-utopians. But, um, you know, from our perspective, you know, unfortunately, um, the, the most powerful utopian imaginings, at least graphically, you know, I always ask my students on the first day of in graduate school in urban design, you know, bring some images of some, some fabulous utopian environment. It used to be, you know, until I, you know, been smacking them around for eight years now, that I always get this, this image at the bottom. Um, this was perplexing. Why bring in Blade Runner? Um, I think the reason is that the kind of, the, 
that the, the visual creativity that lies behind this scene um, is so much more mesmerizing than the standard issue architectural product that when you, you are forced into a kind of um, uh, artistic fantasy of the constitution of utopia, it will be, I dare say, and these are, these are value free words, um, it will be different, it will be weird, it will, be, it will have an element of strangeness, it will venture beyond uh, the conventions with which we are accustomed to design cities. But here's another utopian vision. The Ebenezer Allies. And you know, the more I look at this diagram, and I dare say, this is the master plan for Hanoi, uh, you know, in, ske in, in sketch form, um, you know, the, 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 the more logic there is. Um, you know, cities uh, are growing exponentially. You know, and our two characteristic solutions to the, the problem of urban growth, which is to say megacities and sprawl, are simply not on. I mean, these cities, these environments are intractable, they're ungovernable, um, they, they suck. Um, this is a more beautiful vision. You know, it's about compaction, it's about intercommunication, it's about um, rethinking the relationship of the city and the countryside. Um, re-establishing the validity of that difference, um, which is so much done by the boards. Um, and so I, I, I conclude, you know, it's again, this is the Nuremberg Woodstock slide, is that if it is impossible to make this simple distinction within the field of the idea of utopia, people are fools. Um, Auschwitz and Christiania are not the same, um, even though uh, they are both, in terms of a certain kind of oversimplified ideological construction, um, utopian ideas. And so, I introduced the word of the evening, um, not original with me, I think this is a Patrick Geddes, still well worth reading, this guy, uh, Patrick Geddes Courage, um, in which he simply adds the E to the front of utopia, in order to take it out of the Thomas More no place reading, um, and to simply speculate, and I think there is no better articulation of our tasks as architects and urbanists um, than making better places. What the nature of the better is, you know, Eric will you know, give us the platonic reading you know, at the end of the evening. Uh, it was something that is uh, obviously uh, in need of lively disputation, but um, I don't think we should be shy about investing in the idea that our gig is to make better places for better people. I want to live there, for God's sake. I'm not exactly down with the system of governance, um, but it looks awfully groovy to me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, love that Judy Garland. Um, so he, here is one of the first utopias I ever designed. I'm going to give you a little, um, you know, history of uh, my cough. Uh, this <laughs> you see, I brought a smart sport jacket for the piece, but it's warmer around here. Um, I, I, this was a city I built I, 25 years ago. I just sat down one day and thought, oh, I'll just build a city. Um, and uh, this, this became a kind of model for a style of research that I've been engaged in for a long time. I keep building these models. Um, and the idea is um, that uh, you know, we, we are so imprisoned, like the uh, functionaries in Hanoi, um, with, with a kind of uh, deductive style of urban reasoning, you know, where we solve a whole series of um, generalities and then home in on the, uh, on the particulars. Um, you know, the, 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 the induction has, a, has an effect only at the end. So I'm wondering about a kind of fuzzier urban logic in which the representation itself is kind of slack, you know? Um, so I'm looking at this, I, you know, it's a huge model. You know it's big. Uh, and uh, you know, there are many different materialities. The colors of some are suggestive of familiar colors found in the environment. Um, but the only thing that I will vouch for in terms of this model is that every difference represents a difference. So this is a proposition about a kind of degree of variety, about a kind of organizational thing. I only, only Iris, my shrink, knows why I constantly drawing these circular forms, but um, if you all don't do it, it's okay. Uh, so one needs values in order to animate um, 
a kind of the, the, the relatively autonomous activity of design. And again, this is one of the arguments I want to make to you tonight, is that um, the autonomy of design, this is Eric was going on with this intrinsic, extrinsic, post-trinsic, uh, Intrinsic, extrinsic theory, whatever. Uh, that that um, so here is I forget whether this is the extrinsic or the intrinsic uh, virtue. Um, but you know, if if design and its relative autonomy is one, um, then it is answerable to a series of values. So we have a way of vetting our design um, in terms not of a kind of a set of formal formal and taste-based issues, although that's important, more about that later, but in terms of what the utopian with an e-city will be. And here are my list of criteria, you know, it's, a, it's final. Um, its main measure is the human body. Um, it works very hard. Uh, I'm in the Jane Jacobs, Kim Il-sung, uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, or target import substitution mode in terms of my my uh, theorizing of urban economics. Um, it is about its locale. Um, it's complicated. It is equitable, always the goal. Um, it's singular. I think every city has the right to its own set of differences. And it's green. So now we get into the work. I'm speaking unusually slowly, I noticed tonight. It's because of the, all the drugs I took on the airplane. in hopes of having a nap before I got out here. All right, so here's another, here's another early uh, city project that, that, that I did, a, utop a utopian project, a project about um, um, kind of uh, uh, not entirely analyzed systems of difference. So the quick prehistory of the project, um, some of you are old enough to remember that the, before the last bush, there was another bush. Um, you know, an equally rancid fascist jerk off. Uh, and and uh, like father, like son, he also invaded uh, Iraq. Um, and uh, th th there came a day when we had, victory was ours, uh, the troops came home from, from Kuwait, and in order to celebrate, they had a parade on Broadway, uh, you know, a few blocks from the studio. So we took the afternoon off. We went to the parade, and it was fantastic. You know, those desert uniforms, beautiful. You know, you've got to say that the United States Army is a kind of rainbow coalition under the first good-looking, buff young people, you know, stepping smartly up Broadway. But then they got to Canal Street. Excuse me if I follow you arcane New York geography. We're still downtown. They got to Canal Street, and they broke up. Parade ended. They went. They repaired to the flesh pots of Greenwich Village and did what uh, you know youth in uniform will do after a spirited parade. And I, my thought was, what a waste! <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if instead of breaking up and heading for the saloons, um, they were to keep marching up Broadway until they got to the South Bronx, to Harlem, um, to all those places um, where their resources, um, technical, financial. Uh, uh, organizational could be put to some useful purpose. Mm -hmm. Schools, cure, cure diseases, clean up the environment. <coughs> Imagine what a, a, few, a few million um, disciplined, well-trained, well-equipped people could do uh, in your town. Um, so these were the days you know, when they were still advertising that you know, Ronald Reagan had won the Cold War and we were going to get a peace dividend. What it was going to be was unclear, but I thought, ah, Um, they, they, they have you know, several hundred years of kind of cultural uh, uh, memory, organization, you know. They know the guys in Halle Britain. Um, what can we give them to do that, that has the kind of stature, you know, the, the kind of energetic stature of warfare, but is constructive, of course? What better for them to do in their, in their sunset years than to build the cities that we So we cast around for uh, a site, um, and we found this one which we call, the 60s guy, uh, Weed, Arizona, which is on a, a kind of existing uh, uh, artificial sluiceway. There's a dam, oh God, on the left, uh, on the lower Colorado River. 
And it was ironically the place where uh, desert warfare was practiced and tested. So it seemed, you know, kind of lovely symmetry here with the, what they had just done and what they might do. So, have you ever heard the word zipitone? Uh, so here, here is the first, here's the site plan. Yeah, here's the zipitone site plan. And, um, you know, again, th this, this rehearses some of the motherhood issues that will recur in projects that I'm going to show you. So, cities based on neighborhoods. Yeah, this is the formal, the formal and organizational and social bedrock of any decent urbanism. These are all calculated to be 10 minute walking radius. Totally down with Jane Jacobs. I'll read the books. Uh, so, a series of neighborhoods, uh, no more than 20 minutes from the edge, which is hard, uh, to this big uh, artificial lake. And kind of the, the sluice way comes through here as a transportation artery. And as I said, uh, one of the important values of um, uh, successful urbanism is the ability to get lost. A little bit of confusion, I think, is uh, helpful. You need to learn your city. Uh, so it's fairly complicated, and there are no cars. Um, and there is a colored drawing, sepia, the secret sepia print technique went a little bit, uh, but, but never mind. Anyway, so you can see it's complicated. Um, you can see that the ratios, the differences um, between green space and blue space and bill space, and you will forgive a certain uh, willfully primitive language, you know, if you're going to reinvent things, you know, what's the words worth line? Uh, you know, heaven lies about us in our childhood. I mean, you know, start, start yourself young. Um, there's the model. And there's a piece. There's a fragment of we, Arizona, which I will dilate on for one moment. Um, so green is green, blue is blue, and that color is built. Now, you know, it's an interesting formal exercise. Um, I, you know, but I, but I believe in the difference. Right? There's a, it's, it's, a, it's a scale drawing. So this may be uh, begonias, and this may be rapeseed, uh, you know, that may be children at play. Um, you know, that could be the hot tub, and that could be the tilapia farm. Um, but, I, but I believe in the differences. I don't, I don't exactly know what they are. Um, and this is the architecture. You see, the architecture is dimensioned fairly consistently. So if you remember my set of principles, and if you uh, believe with me that the principal measure of uh, urban dimension should be the body, um, then you can kind of calculate uh, how wide things are going to be. We know there should be appropriate insulation. We know that's going to know. We know that there should be uh, appropriate uh, orientation um, to views and solar exposure. We know that in the range of human activities, um, tend to, to, to spend most of our time in spaces that are um, dimension, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of limited range of dimensions. And so one, one proposes, and this is what we're liberated to do in the 21st century, um, you know, when we're moving beyond the kind of 19th century style of production uh, into cleaner, softer, more distributed, more knowledge basis, based forms. Um, this is a city that's configured like a law. Um, which is to say, um, there is no zoning. You know, the, the, other, the other curse of the Hanoi plan is they have six zoning categories which are applied everywhere, when in fact, there should be one predominant zoning category. I mean, zoning by use is a, is a, is a curse. There should be one predominant zoning category, which is, you know, anything everywhere. Um, if it meets the tests uh, of uh, environmental rationale, Convenience and you know all the, all the other kind of self-evident logics that we architects know about. So there's another place. I mean, I you know although the city is a lot, this is the Piazza Navona of Weed, Arizona. Strong believer, historic president. A um, bunch of uh, theaters. So this is probably the kind of uh, entertainment district. Um, and here's someplace else. Again, willfully primitive language. Um, you know, one big one bit uh, these guys. What, you know, if, if the next sheet were there, these guys would go like so. And one of the big morphological issues that I think we have to consider, you are considering, is the fact that in the city of the future, there will still be bigger things than smaller things. And the compatibility of big things and small things is a difficult exercise. I mean, if you're down with the kind of Jane Jacobs formula, 
uh, about how to design a good city, which stipulates, among other things, that a pedestrian should have a choice at least once every 200 feet, um, then a thousand foot long building becomes perplexing in terms of that kind of organization. And I think that these um, morphological versus functional uh, versus social um, conund conundra are, are absolutely central to the way that we need to think about cities. Um, not too specific. So here's a neighborhood that's round. Uh, that was a soccer field. Uh, here's a central place. Again, you know, ever since we discovered the idea that um, the public is not a unity, you know, and all of us kind of bien urbanists know um, that there are multiple publics and that there are, you know, uh, Spanish people like to picnic in a certain way and skateboarders need another kind of space and, uh, you know, uh, uptight to uh, yuppies uh, like Starbucks, you know, whatever it is, there are, there are multiple publics. Um, my, my anxiety about this is that um, there, there is a baby that goes out with the bathwater of this kind of unitary, with this, this idea that public space has a history. Um, and that is that, I, you know, I, I, I still think that the meeting of bodies in space, you know, the most important thing that the city produces um, must take place um, in a variety of registers, but in physical space. So to think about the parks and plazas and all this kind of traditional you know, Jesus, Vlad Andrei Strami is not in the room. Uh, you know, all this kind of uh, traditional repertoire uh, of gathering deeply ingrained in our kind of genetic uh, consciousness um, is something absolutely critical. Um, spines lead into the water, and it has an edge. Okay, here's another utopia. Um, commissioned, we were, by an architectural magazine to design, you know, this was at the turn of the century, uh, to design the retirement community of the century, which you know, I regarded as a kind of riposte, a kind of aggressive suggestion to a boomer such as myself. Um, you know, I, I don't know about what your, your geograph account, but mine is down to minus zero. Uh, so we'll never retire. Um, so it was an, an occasion to design a little village. Um, again, motherhood. Cars all get left there. Um, it's kind of clustery in terms of sub-villages. There is, however, a gigantic golf course. Just what is the retirement community without one? Um, but this, this, is a, this is a place which is not so lawful. Right? This is based on a housing typology, which is a row house. So here is a row of houses. They all face south. They all have greenhouses uh, in order to uh, eat the vegetables, you know, uh, a space of conviviality and pleasure in the sun. Each row has a living machine, you, you know, this, this technology, very, very important to bioremediation stuff, which can take your turds and produce gray water, which you can then use to water the garden or flush the toilet. Um, very scalable, you know, could be done at the scale of the house, the row, the neighborhood, even the city. This is great technology. Um, and then there were the slightly Row houses. Um, I, yeah. So we, we, we were much enamored in those days with this, this soy derived plastic panel system that we learned about. Um, so these were meant to be, you know, snapped together as soy panel something, you know, highly renewable. Uh, and of course, given that it's a retirement community, there was the added advantage in using this technology that should the social security check be a little bit late. Uh, you could dig into the living room. Um, and, and then there is this. You know, I, I began to mention the, the, the whole question of movement systems in cities. And cities are, in fact, juxtaposition engines. They are instruments for bringing people together and keeping them apart uh, you know, as, as necessary. And the history, I will give you the one minute history of um, modern ur urbanism. The history of modern urbanism is, is about cities playing a game of catch-up with transportation systems that were designed with no thought to the kind of city they would produce. So if the 19th century city was completely deformed uh, by the invention of the railway, the 20th century city has been completely deformed by the invention of the automobile. So why not think about this in a slightly different way? So I mean, this is a bit of a generic bubble car, but if you were to list the criteria of a vehicle, um, that would conduce um, uh, slow movement, 
neighborhood concentration, uh, a lack of demand for high-speed movement over long distances, it would have, you know, it would be slow, uh, it would be soft, uh, it would be non-emitting, uh, it would be generally friendly. Um, it would not be fast enough uh, to be a kind of default for taking long trips, but it would be fast enough to offer a certain level of inconvenience to help people who are encumbered in one way or another, and of course, uh, when I ordered the collected introductions of Eric Moss um, from Amazon, uh, the uh, robotic bubble car would arrive, as it always does, exactly at 9.43 the next morning, and with its robot claw arm, lay it on the Chippendale sideboard uh, that lies just next to the living machine. The living room! Uh, house of the future. Again, who are we designing for? I mean, again, again, you know, urban planners are like generals, always fighting the last war. Um, most of the real estate product we see in here, here I think Andres Rodney could take it on the nose, um, is still designed with nostalgia for the hegemony of the nuclear family, which is no longer the leading category of uh, residential life. So here's a kind of co-housing scheme. Um, uh, again, uh, same, same, same deal, a kind of doubling with a living machine. Uh, this drives me over, looks sad. Um, ah, and now we get to Asia. So here's a, here's a city that follows on to that weed city. Um, and again, a little anecdote. Um, th th this was, you know, I missed out on that big wave of projects in Japan. Uh, so, many, so many architects of my generation were able to engorge themselves on uh, that, that particular bubble. Um, but I finally did get invited there in the, the, the late 90s. Um, and the first place that I visited um, was, uh, God, what was it? A big ugly city. Um, uh, Osaka, yeah. So I, I, I was in Osaka. Maybe you can get a little more Coca Cola kids. Um, so I was in Osaka, and uh, I was being taken around by a local architect, you know, visiting firemen, and uh, driving down the big boulevards lined with ugly concrete buildings, when we came upon an arresting site, which was between two gigantic concrete office buildings, there was a farm. Uh, how could this be, I asked, um, perplexed. Um, thinking about how real estate works in New York and the likelihood of finding a farm next door to Rockefeller Center is um, fairly negligible. Um, but it seems, you know, the Japanese have a very special reverence for self-sufficiency in agriculture, um, and the inheritance laws are written in such a way that um, a farm that remains in the family and is continually farmed uh, is not taxed. Um, so these, these anomalies, even if they're speculative, are possible. So never mind that it was a kind of fantastical idea. The idea that, you know, even under this weird economic regime, and all economic regimes are weird, um, because of values, there was a kind of subsidy operation that made possible the presence of a farm next door to a skyscraper. So that sounded great to me. So we designed Neurasia, um, in which you can see there are a lot of farms, uh, and uh, they're kind of everywhere. Um, again, same principle as we, you know, that these are village-like instead of um, uh, neighborhood-like, because, you know, the majority of the growth in Asian cities, people coming in from the countryside, uh, feel right at home here. Again, um, it's about difference uh, rather than specification, but it's dimensionally precise, uh, you know, it's done to scale, and we're not Luddites, so there's the the maglev railroad that gets you from Hanoi to uh, Hong Kong in you know, 11 minutes. Um, and it's complicated, and there aren't any other appeals. And here's a little round neighborhood. You know, I love the little round neighborhood. Um, next to a transit stop, you know, it's going to be accumulating certain kinds of things. You can see the shadows, these are a little, little small. I mean, I, I revert to my, the point that I didn't quite finish, talking about weed. Um, which is, you know, I was saying that you can figure out the lateral dimensions of a building uh, without knowing what's going to go on there. If you want breezes to blow through and sun to penetrate from one side to the other. 
But if you really believe in a body-based urbanism, you can also figure out the section. You can figure out the vertical dimension. Um, and I refer to um, some extensive empirical research I have done, um, which is to say I have lived for 25 years on the fifth floor of a tenant walk-up building in New York City. And I can say with absolute certainty that five floors of stair climbing is the absolute limit uh, for <laughs> reasonably fit middle-aged Americans. Um, so, once you take this, uh, this, this kind of valuing of human locomotion as one of the engines of urban design, you know, things are gonna, not going to be much more than five stories tall. And there is going to be an edge. The city is going to stop. So then we got a commission to do an actual town uh, in Laos. And again, it's a, it's a kind of a company town, big factory down here. But again, organized in terms of this village structure, um, the, 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 the non-laboring members of the family would be able to grow food for themselves. Um, there is a kind of central place along this uh, most desirable river edge. Um, there is a road that bypasses to keep the, the, the industrial traffic away. And it is laced with paths that allow you to bicycle anywhere. And of course, it's indigenous as all get out. Uh, and um, filled with signifiers uh, of good intentions vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the production of environmentalism. You know, here, paddy fields, windmills, uh, local materials, small scale. So these, are, these are issues that seem suitable to us in thinking about a town. This is a, another um, um, a, a development commission. Um, for this, this place, Um, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately for justice, the developer is in jail, but uh, uh, hasn't helped the project. Um, so th th this is the, uh, the former racetrack of Penang in, in, in Malaysia, a wonderful city, um, you know, which, which you know, the, the Chinese you know, who are busy fouling their nest and tearing down their heritage. I mean, the, George, Georgetown, the old part of Penang, has the, the best intact kind of collection of shop houses of architecture, maybe, maybe in the time. It's great. Um, and we were persuaded to do this project, which otherwise I, I think this is a kind of vile site to make a big, a big project, hard as it is against the hill, but they were already making the idiotic freeway. And the argument that, that persuaded us was this, this is the historic core, and there were already towers beginning to sprout there, and they said, what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to put them over here, which will save it over here. Okay, uh, you know, $25,000 in that argument, you know, we'll, we'll make some drawings. Um, so this is the drawing we made, uh, or this is the plan that we did. And again, I want to stress the idea, in terms of this ecological footprint, that one of the bases for thinking about architecture and planning at any scale is the idea of harmonization. Sounds, sounds, sounds very Asian, too. Um, the idea simply being, that one endeavors to balance on a single site all the resources necessary to make it go. Um, so in this case, um, we are collecting and providing all the water. All the energy is produced on site. We are remediating all of the sewage. There are as many jobs as there are grown-ups. There are as many schools as there are school kids. And while one doesn't argue that everybody who lives here has to work here, Still, I think that this kind of harmonized, this kind of statistical harmonization is a very clear way of taking responsibility for what you have done to the plan. So one looks at what one can. Um, that's the ground floor plan. Again, it's, it's a very simple organization. The cars are lifted at the edge. There's one circulation loop with a, you know, a yak dung powered uh, slow moving bus on a three minute head time circles around and drops you anywhere. Um, it's got the university and performing arts and shopping and schools and medical facilities and little houses and apartment buildings and, you know, the bureau half hold. You know, give us some credit guys, drawings, and we can go through those quickly, but trust me, uh, it works. Uh, and there it is. And I, I refer you to this artificial mountain because more about that later. Um, these are the main apartment buildings and um, you know they're, they're designed for the climate. So I mean 
I, I think the innovation in this project is that these um, maisonettes can be ventilated on six sides, which is to say the four you would expect plus top and bottoms that's there. There's a kind of spiral circulation system which allows them to have some gaps. And that's, you know, that's 90% of the game. Like I say, ventilation, insulation, you're almost there in terms of your environmental, you know, you don't have to go much farther on your stupid bee checklist than can you open the window. Um, so th there it is, you know, town, special building, usual buildings, building that looks like a mountain. There is the objective at the top of the Panagas. This is going to be the place to have a bar mitzvah, and I trust it. <laughs> um, uh, the the uh, rail system that was proposed, the you know, Birkenweg Hotel, transit thing, these are water catchers lined with PVs. Here's the cultural center over here is this kind of this uh, franchise mall of foreign universities. Not that idea. Um, you can see they're happy as <laughs> as all get out, you know, drinking their lattes. This is that single street that rotates uh, around and uh, provides the main circulation. That's the reverse shot down the hill. This was the one building that we thought we would make. But again, the, the idea of, um, you know, the, 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 the mix devolves on smaller and smaller scales. So this is one way of retail, dentist's office, commercial stuff. Then instead of a mechanical floor, a so called green floor where the bioremediation stuff takes place, the recycling, maybe a daycare center, you know, a lovely thing, then the apartments and the, the stuff catcher. Um, here's a whole city that we designed, trying to shrink an ecological footprint. And as you can see from this image, this city is completely traditional um, in, in terms of its density gradient. It has a principal center. 100% um, of the surface area of this city is green. Um, sometimes displaced to the roof, sometimes cantilevered, sometimes indoor. But you know, I, again, I kind of I, I once wrote a utopia in the form of a building many years ago, something called local code. And without, I was trying to write it without any actual morphological spectrum, just a series of kind of desirable things. So, you know, if you wanted to investigate a radical possibility, and you said to yourself. I'm going to design a city, and 100% of the surface area, the, the, the uh, land area of the city, is to be green. Well, how would you pull that off? Um, these are the neutralities, the harmonizations that we uh, achieved in, in this design. Um, whoops. Uh, and and here, here, here is, here it is. Here is its footprint with traditional technology, and here is the footprint with green technology. There is nothing exotic uh, in, in this proposition. And I, I think that's something that I, I want to preach to you as well, is that um, I'll show you another project about making New York City entirely self-sufficient. And the limit we set ourselves was um, you know, no anti-gravity paint. Um, in fact, no technology that is not immediate, either, either on the shelf or immediately foreseeable. Um, So th th there it is, 100% green. Um, here is, it's got a mind of its own, it's doing that. Uh, again, this, this is a kind of a, a, a density diagram. You can see that it's kind of thicker to the center, it's got a central park, it's got a subsidiary park, here are the big buildings around the river, um, and it has hard edges. Um, this is the zone beyond which uh, internal combustion vehicles may not penetrate, this is the new mix of movement that takes place in this city. Um, and here is a very complicated street diagram. You know, one of the reasons that we build somebody's the stand most side device in my ear. Um, one, one of the reasons that we build cities with big straight streets is that we have vehicles um, that need to accelerate uh, over a long distance and then decelerate over a long, over a long distance. I mean, once you eliminate that, um, then you can all be Camilo Zita uh, and think about cities of much greater order of complexity, much richer uh, kind of intersection of circulatory possibilities, um, uh, including those, and uh, neighborhoods. 
Now, a neighborhood is something that doesn't uh, get designed. You know, we, we know the modernist folly of, of thinking about the so-called neighborhood unit. You know, there will be 2.5 schools, 11 and a half, 7 and 11s, uh, 4,000 housing units, and a tennis court. Uh, this is not a formula for producing a neighborhood. Neighborhoods are organic, they grow. But how do you conduce the idea of neighborhood if you're building from scratch? And my argument to you is that, you know, if the world's urban population is, and it is, growing at the rate of one million people every week, it's a pretty fair city we need to deliver uh, by next Friday. Um, and it's going to have neighborhoods. So here is a way of trying to conduce neighborhoods. You know, locating centers in the 10-minute radius, um, manipulating the density regulations, um, uh, perhaps introducing a code that specifies something about the formal, tectonic, or material character of the works, um, looking at um, uh, groups of 10,000, you know, in, in terms of the dimensions of the areas that they would occupy. I mean, none of these is a neighborhood, but all of these help it. Um, and then there's the, you know, the usual boring, uh, you know, weekly architecture of whatever month it was uh, back then when we did this. But um, not shy about the idea that cities become encrusted um, with, other, with other people's tastes and other people's ideas. Um, a golden oldie. Um, because one of the arguments that I, I want to make to you about cities, you know, I, I gave my little riff about the, the dreaded the Starbucks on every corner homogenization that we all feel, fear, um, is that you know, wh where are we going to find the relevant differences for this, all these cities we must make, one a week, you know, for the rest of the eternity? Um, and I dare say that the premium, um, since the originating cultural context is gone, you know, that where it's going to come from are rigorous attention to kind of biochromatic considerations, um, rigorous consideration to living cultural patterns, um, and imagination. So I think that it's a great time to be an urban historian architect because we are the, uh, the systems makers. You know, we, 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 are, we are the ones who are going to look for sources for the differentiation of these places that would otherwise not occur. We, we are the resistance. So I am making an argument here that we need to reintroduce, but in a kind of rational way, the idea of taste. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, actually, it was only, only after having drawn this that we realized that uh, this probably spoke a little too directly to a certain post-nuclear anxiety uh, <laughs> in Japan. But, you know, the green idea was the thing lands, you know, its tendrils stick out, and all of this track is totally frustrating. You know, they are, you know, in the, sa in the same way, uh, and my best wish is to build Clinton, in the, sa in the same way that when a, there's a blockage in a coronary artery, um, you know, other, other vessels develop around the blockage. This is the idea that, uh, and I'll show you another version of this later, that the strategic blockage um, causes a kind of informal evasion of its consequences. So there it lands, and you can see it's kind of bleeding green in all directions. Um, another, how am I doing in time? What time is it? Wait, watch. Eight ten? Twenty, but I mean, these people may have plans. Huh? I studied at the knee of Fidel Castro, you know, in this, the uh, Fidelista school of uh, elocution. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, another project in Japan. This was this was this was a real commission for a um, clean incinerator using some proprietary German technology. And we know how good they are in ovens, um, uh, which, uh, which apparently was going to emit nothing from the, these smokestacks. So we were going to borrow the heat, have the public bath. Um, and surround it uh, with the eco dump. We're all kind of recycling uh, activities. And the Japanese are actually pretty far ahead of the curve in terms of reusing things and recycling them. Um, but it did look this one at, at the end of the day. Uh, and it, and uh, yeah, you remember the mountain. So here's a site in Shanghai that we did on commission from the Shanghai government. And this is, you know, it can happen to kids. 
This is now. This is now officially incorporated in the master plan of Shanghai. And we were commissioned to look at this area. This is a big train station. This is the, you know, the, the river. And then this is something called the Suzhou Creek, which is a kind of fetid waterway in a great location, um, which needed to be reclaimed. And there were some projects along its banks. So we were asked to look at this area between the <coughs> station and the, the, the waterway and reclaim a kind of pedestrian. So our main objective here is what was happening in Shanghai was that um, the blocks were getting bigger and bigger. You know, they were very much enamored of super blocks, giant projects, big developers. So we wanted to do something that would insinuate a kind of network that would prevent the aggregation of blocks um, into forms too large. Again, I get back to the 200 foot rule and the idea that there must be alternatives. And what used to be on this, side, on this part of the site, which was wiped out, of course, is that medievally textured, wooden, you know, Jap uh, Chinese uh, uh, village architecture that's you know, totally un unhygienic, completely deteriorated, but fantastic. So we wanted to keep some complexity. So we inserted this rather complicated green system to thwart the aggregation of the blocks, and then, of, of the blocks, and then located a bunch of buildings. Uh, uh, at what we thought would be an appropriate scale, recovering the waterfront, uh, because those are the buildings. Um, and uh, again, this, this was very much in mind from the get-go. Um, you know, one of these days I'm going to do a building that looks just like that. Uh, and, and why not? You know, what, what, why abstract it, translate it, uh, modify it, you know, if the dimensions are fine? So, uh, Helong Bay, the most beautiful place on the world, on my phone. Um, you know, also something that people have a kind of Jones for mountains. Uh, so we figured that would go down well with them. And, uh, but you have to look at a kind of, you know, the inhabited mountain, this is a rather fatigued metaphor to be sure. Um, but, uh, you know, my favorite buildings in New York, by the way, are the, the buildings of this firm called Boris Mailin and Walker. Ralph Walker, you know this architect, uh, from the 20s and 30s, who did the best of the kind of um, Mayans meet the Rockies, deco, telephone company buildings. So that was very much in my look at that. I'm a, I'm a modest collector of these so-called philosopher's stones, and that's one of them. Why, why not? It's much, much better ventilated than the first mountain. Uh, and working at it, then this drive is rather interesting. Here are the sites, um, and each of these mountains is dead on in terms of the legal FAR uh, for each of the sites. Um, then, unfortunately, we suffered a failure of nerve, um, and uh, if we ever get back to it, I think these mountains are going to be managed. Um, just finish this competition. Um, uh, university campuses are, 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 I would say, in terms of everyday utopias, about as close as we get. You know, people working for the public good, um, very much of common purpose, and perhaps uh, except at the University of Alabama. Um, uh, pedestrian environments, um, you know, filled with all sorts of good things. So we were given this corner to do, and as you can see, um, we wanted to create a network that would stitch all these dreadful uh, existing buildings together into a kind of single uh, conceptualization and to, make, to make a campus in the midst of a rather dreary uh, part of Tang Shan. Um, and I, I show this to you in order to introduce a, a kind of problematic is, you know, I, I, tr I have tried really hard to sell it. Um, you know, 61 years old, Jesus Christ, I want to build some buildings. So, I, you know, I, I now know, and Eric explained this to me, that if a developer says to you, do this, you say, how soon? <laughs> so uh, th 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 this, this, the morphology of this project is very much shaped um, by, by what we were told was, was a kind of desiderata in China for residential buildings, which is nobody will live on the north side of the building. So somehow, um, although the, this, this was irrelevant to the good views on this campus, um, created all kinds of problems um, in terms of spatial, spatial efficiency. Um, this was all solved with no north-facing anything. Um, 
so it's a, a hotel, it's an incubator building, it's the doctor's housing, it's the faculty housing, it's the giant the mechanical engineering lab, it's the shopping. Um, it's the mix, you know, it's okay. It's a little bit mountainous, you know, we stuck some sort of symbolic baby mountains to illuminate the underground parking. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then we got this project. Yeah. Could be built, this one. Um, and uh, this was the creature that was very, very much in my mind. I, I don't know where it came from. Yeah. Came from the bottom of the sea, of course. But I, I, I don't know why this creature and that project um, coalesced, but they did. So we designed this, whoops, this hotel. Um, and, uh, Everything. It's cool, uh, and it, it, it could be built, you know, jerk offs never get it together, they were be easy. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm fumbling here because there's no explanation. Um, and, and, and I think there is a point in the kind of architectural imaginary where no explanation is necessary. I mean, functionalism, of course, is the mother tongue of modernity as far as architecture. And we can certainly tell you uh, about um, how to open the window, and you know, it's a seven-star hotel, whatever the hell that means. You know, why there are 11 bidets in every room. Uh, but uh, I, I, have an, I have a lawyer who has a very annoying habit um, when I say the Ukraine is ridiculous. You know, do something. No, oh, it is what it is. Um, at which point I attempt to smack him. Um, but here, here again, you know, it is what it is. Um, it is what it is with this site plan. This is the hotel. These are two uh, uh, clubs, which are smaller hotels. You know, it's on this constructed piece of land in a, a kind of vast mud flat in Tianjin that they're trying to turn into Dubai. Um, I don't think it will harm anybody. Um, you know, we conscientiously propose environmental systems up the wazoo. We'll, we'll We'll see. Oh, press cost too high. Um, it has a fantastic restaurant and bar up here, a giant tank of floating jellyfish illuminated from underneath here, and you know, about two rooms to the floor. You can see these kind of interiors. Yeah, not that big, not a bad couch. You know, it's a lot of, you know, a thousand meter only. So, um, you know, I was, I was telling you the other day about, uh, the other day, that's how it feels to me. Uh, I'm standing here. Could some technician come up here and shoot this fucker? Go back. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do the rest of the lecture about slides. Um, this was a project of it. Is somebody actually commanding this? Stop! Okay. Um, thank you. Don't, don't go, don't go. Um, we, 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 all, we all know this, right? So, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, one of the reasons they were um, troubled with the idea that utopia would turn, it, turn into Auschwitz is that modernism took its kind of um, functionalist uh, reasoning and turned it into Auschwitz. Um, you know, like this. So again, um, you know, I, I offered you a proposition, a kind of a blanket proposition that might, as a kind of experimental uh, modality, produce something interesting. Okay, 100% of the city is green. So here is a proposition that says 100% of the apartments face south. 
and uh, you know this unhappy uh, result took place. So we just finished two weeks ago uh, a 4,500 unit project in China, uh, in which 100% of the units must face south, otherwise cannot sell. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just get New York. So how do you deal with 100% of units facing south? It's, it's completely idiotic, you know? Morning sun is nice, and you know, sunsets are beautiful, um, there's something to see up there, obviously this is south, so this is what we produce. You know, you, you were first, I mean, you, you know that you, you know, your, your, your first move is to line everything up so it faces south. The buildings are obviously going to be attenuated in the east-west direction, um, but then you've got to figure out a way to wiggle it, and you've got to figure out a way, again, very <coughs> Hildesheimer-esque, of making sure that the building on, in front, you know, on the south side, does not get a shadow on the building to its top. So we have going to develop this system in which, um, on the southern side of each of these, these uh, lanes, or low-rise buildings, on the northern side of the higher-rise buildings that would not be affected, and that they were staggered in such a way, you can see that the shadows would not be cast on the buildings um, to their north. Um, then we introduced the 75 meter, mentioned over there, rule about being able to make movements. Um, we added a kind of main street and social space through the thing, um, and punctuated it with all the kind of community facilities that, that we could. And, uh, not that existing historic canal, you know, lots of canals coming off it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not yet sure what I think. You know, Central Park, the area, the commercial area. I think it's okay for this project. It's going to be okay for one of them. Um, and th this is the kind of character of the thing. So you see the low buildings to the south, not casting a shadow. Lovely canals as a, as a feature for the higher buildings, which is the right. Um, of course, you know, you do a project like this, you also run into the fact it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's stops. Oh, I'm sitting. They're the groovy curved corners, but they are not all kind of the same. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, we didn't quite get in as much fuzzy green stuff as we had anticipated. Um, but you know, when we get this gig, uh, the building's very skinny, you know, in order to, and here's the entrance to that to kind of main spine that flows through the thing. And now we conclude with a few projects. This is uh, our, this is Far Rock, a giant urban renewal site where we were commissioned by a city agency to do a study of 2,500 uh, housing units. And um, there, there are basically two ways, I think. Of that. That, that's a fabulous site. It's right on the Atlantic, wonderful views, you know, on the beach. You know, that conceptually speaking, there are two ways of dealing with projects at the beach or on the waterfront. You know, one is, you know, Public Cabana, Lakeshore Drive, uh, Riverside Drive. You know, we load everything in the direction of the view, you know, preferably single-loaded single, single loaded, uh, system. You know, everybody sees the scene. Um, the other is, you know, Sancho Pez, Istanbul, or something, um, where it's more of a village scale and your relationship to the, the scenus is potentially more indirect, you know. You hear the calling of the gulls, uh, you smell the salt breezes, you know, there's sand in the carpet, um, you get the occasional view. So, we picked B for our scheme, um, and there it was. And this is a scheme that was very much generated by this unique New York condition, which is, that's the subway, that's the A train elevated, and that's the beach, that's the, subway, that's the beach. So this axis obviously was crucial. Um, it's a kind of walled condition with um, um, more collective uses around this perimeter. These are not ours. Um, and, and with super blocks. Again, can't be too orthodox. Super block can work under certain circumstances. Um, you know, there it is again. And each of these chromosome-like things is a, uh, is, a, is a housing, it's a 12-unit uh, housing, sort of semi-co-housing. So here we're facing south, yeah? So again, the, the greenhouse with the bioremediation machine, the collective social space, uh, the ability to do some solar heating, 
stiff breeze off the ocean, giant bioswale, wide roads, and super blocks where the children roam free. Um, this again is the percolation zone because the floods tend to come from this direction. And here are the special purpose buildings. Um, the plans were done in such a way that they were both regular and sufficiently eccentric that at least one room in every apartment um, got a shot all the way to the ocean. Um, yeah, subway station, beach. Subway station, beach. Um, East New York, um, and this is a kind of Godzilla-like project, I return to it. We're getting towards the end here. Um, East New York, poor neighborhood in Brooklyn, not far from that other site, um, rich in two, um, in two ways, in poor, poor in every other way, but rich in the vast amount of vacant land that it, that it had at that point, uh, and um, rich in a very activated community um, for whom we were acting as consultants. And uh, these were people who were, were um, they, were, they were green. They were growing vegetables. They were feeding the homeless with vegetables they were growing on vacant lots. So we loved these people. But what to do for them? You know, they had that kind of um, rural fantasies, and they wanted it very green, and they wanted to deal with densities. They wanted to deal with the fact that this was a place that had absolutely no centers. You know, there would be a shop on one block. Four blocks later, there would be another. Um, vacant lots. This used to be the place because it was so derelict and so convenient to the freeway uh, that the mafia used to quickly drive off, dump Guido's body uh, in the lot, and you know, be on the, e the east end of Long Island before anybody noticed. So it began to drop. And th this is a, a kind of um, what I choose to call a Marcel Marceau, which the new elements in the green, the blue, and the bill. They're, they're, they're feeling now like they're looking for a, a suitable place to fly. And they're feeling and they're collecting and they're this drunk. Um, uh, ooh, not a bad drunk. Done with pencils. Uh, um, but uh, of course, if you have a meeting with a community group tomorrow and that's all you got. Uh, <laughs> It's time for plan B. So uh, we asked ourselves, OK, if, if we want to transform this neighborhood into this condition, which we only imperfectly understand, what might be a single move that we could produce that would engender this mysterious transformation? And that was it. So we went to them and we said, OK, here's what you must do. Find an intersection and plant a tree in the middle of it. And it all became clear again. It's the, the kind of uh, collateral artery development, it's the traffic calming, it's the pedestrianization, and that allowed us to make the uh, serious drawing in which these, you know, we all hear about urban acupuncture. Well, that's it, you know? You selectively plant these trees in the intersection. They cause a kind of calming in their lee where the lower density, uh, you know, single family and granny flats farmhouse development takes place. But I think this was the interesting discovery that by selectively reducing the density around the neighborhood, we could force an increase in density um, in central places and give this place the traditional urban centers that it was so completely lacking. And then decided to look at a building type that might go in here and, a, and pick it up in place. Uh, and uh, mushrooms. I mean, I'm not showing you the whole mushroom series, but you know, Mushrooms are also mushrooms, mountains, jellyfish. Where is this coming from? So, you know, as, as, as after a rain, these mushrooms spring up in vacant lots. And one of the things they produce is this uh, additional transportation movement, which is a kind of pedestrian web that begins to insinuate itself in the neighborhood. So, you know, totally reasonably scale, it fits right in with the existing architecture uh, section, maybe. Less so. That's right, Andre made that drawing. Jetson's like thing. I think a few drawings are missing. Um, but essentially, what happens here is that, um, I don't know what happened to the plants, is that there's a, a kind of central space, which is collective. Uh, and then these pods radiate from it, which become private. And then the roof becomes public again. When I, when I, when I was 
Jerry Pepper from Pennsylvania saying, well, it's the semi-public space and the semi-private space. I never quite understood what, what, what the difference was. But I think this is public. I think this gets to be semi-private. And then I think this gets to be semi-public, or maybe it's extrinsic and intrinsic. Um, and two more projects. One, one uh, uh, a project near my house, and water, waterfront projects are going a dime a dozen in the world, and you know, they are very interesting because, um, you know, edge conditions are interesting. You know, unfortunately, you know, New York City has about 600 miles of water. Um, and finally, people are kind of waking up and smelling the bacon, it's getting developed. Um, unfortunately, there are only two problems for the development of the waterfront in New York. One of them is a, a, you know, an old Stedian park, you know, like Riverside Park, and the other is fucking Battery Park City, which is to say a narrow walkway and then giant condos for rich arbitrage. Um, I think one must think about the waterfront a little differently, not, not as a scene, but as a gradient, so that the waterfront has its impact deep in the city. You know, whether it's the Union Hall here, or the Siemens Bar, um, and it's also a gradient in terms of conditions. You know, from terra firma, to fill, to wetlands, to piers, to kind of things that are floating, to things that are just floating and moving. So I think this gradient is something to think about. I, I, I tell a brief anecdote about how we came to this project. We have always specialized in my studio in what we call um, unsolicited master plan. So um, this was an unsolicited master plan for this area of, uh, here's 14th Street. This is Battery Park City, that's where the trade center was. Um, that's where my office used to be. Um, that's where my office is now. Uh, so uh, there used to be an elevated highway and you know, what, one of the joys of my childhood uh, was when my father would drive us up to New York in the 48 Chevy, uh, and then we would go to Brooklyn to visit the grandma. And the trip to Brooklyn took us down this elevated highway, called the Miller Highway, which was built in the 1920s, and there were piers, you know, all the way up to 59th Street, and this intoxicating rhythm, pier and chip, pier and chip, pier and chip, pier and chip, um, was something that just drove me wild. So, I will show you, next lecture I'll show you the ship series. You know, Corp did that already, right? Um, so this highway is there, and one day a truck driver is uh, proceeding along it, and it is so rusty that the truck falls through, the guy is killed, the highway is closed, and the city falls all over itself to try to figure out what to do. Um, and what they decided to do was something called Westway, a very famous project, which was to fill in from Battery Park to 59th Street, 800 feet of the Hudson, from the, the bulkhead line to the pier head, um, creating lovely park space, but of course a total developer bonanza. And this is what we do in New York, is we multiply the available land. Um, and the whole thing was somehow gonna be leveraged and justified by the construction of a 10-lane interstate highway in the bill which would have been, you know, would have made the big dig look, you know, like an ant farm. And it to totally, totally true. And it was an idiotic idea. And the last thing we needed was 10 lanes of trucks barreling under the west side. So there were protests, and um, they were successful. Um, Congress, the great late uh, Congressman Bella Habsuk uh, passed the legislation that now allows cities to trade in uh, highway money for public transit money. Um, uh, but, you know, but, the, but the story, I mean, why the city was doing this was that these interstate highways were financeable at 90% by the federal government. And witness Los Angeles and so many other cities in New York that essentially committed suicide in order to get that money. And New York was prepared to do the same under the Moses years it did it over and over again. The, the construction unions like it, the politicians like it, the developers like it, big struggle. You know, Bella is fighting, but the thing finally turned uh, on the uh, on a lawsuit, an environmental lawsuit, on behalf of the striped bass population of the Hudson River, who it seemed um, found no place more congenial to make you love than under the piers uh, among the pilings. Um, and the nice judge said, well, yes, yes, they are, the, you know, they, are the, you know, they, they can love who they please. 
uh, and where they want. And so you cannot do this thing. And I, I, I tell this anecdote only to retail the best line uh, to have come out of the struggle, which was spoken by our beloved ex-mayor, Ed Koch, who said, he was a strong supporter of the he said, you know, if those striped bears need a place to fuck, I will build them a motel in Peekskill. <laughs> anyway, down, down it went, and so came the alternative master plan. And you can see, like Weed, Arizona, it has this sluice way. The idea being that there should be public transportation finally. There is none for miles. There's still no bus. This is virtually what they've been built, have built already. This boulevard, you know, the nearest bus is up here somewhere. The nearest subway is far away. So let's have some waterborne public transportation. You know, the, the most inescapable logic of the form of New York City is to travel by boat. And we still don't do it. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to be a little reasonable. So this is, this was the great kind of set piece uh, uh, Italianate uh, sunset facing plaza, the Piazza San Giuliani, as we called it in hopes. Uh, this pier got turned into the Villa Savoy. Uh, and th this, this was the, the thing that allowed us to do it. We realized that at high tide, if you snipped off the landward end of the piers and just gave a kind of a little camber uh, to some new bridges, that these uh, kind of Batomouche scale water buses could easily slip under, you know, drop people off, make a connection to a transit way. I mean, you know, it seems so self-evident to us, but it didn't happen. Let's go quickly through this one in hopes that this is the last project. Yes, that deserves a feature. <laughs> so, my, my, I, I recently, and, and come and visit, and, and I'd like to give you all jobs. Um, uh, I, I recently moved, moved into spacious new quarters in, in the same building where I was. And um, in order to satisfy uh, the villains at the Internal Revenue Service, um, I had to divide the space in half. And on one half is my for profit uh, operation, which is called Michael Sorkin Studio. And on the other side is something called Terraform, which is a non um, which does research. And our biggest project, which we've been working on for three and a half years, um, is this, New York City Steady State. And it's a thought experiment, um, you know, like the kinds of thought experiments that I've proposed to you, and it's based on a simple proposition, which is, it is possible for New York City to become completely self-sufficient in everything at its current population within its political borders, that's to say, within the five boroughs. So we've been working through this, and we've licked food, we've done water, we've done waste, We've done air and climate, and we're almost done with transportation. Um, I'm leaving a number of things off the list. We're struggling with the manufacture. Uh, we're struggling with the, the building industry, but you know, within a year, we, we'll have it done. Um, so I just show you in closing a few quick images of the kinds of transformations. And we're looking to, to engender this self-sufficiency at every scale of the city. So we're looking at the scale of the city as a whole. We're looking at different building types. Um, and we're looking at the way in which neighborhoods might be transformed. So without explanation, I just want to show you some before and afters um, you know, of what might happen. You know, the, the wind catchers, the water harvesters, the vertical agriculture, the agricultural bridges, um, the cisterning, uh, a block. I mean, this is a, you know, we're doing it in, in, in increments, kind of 50%, 75%, 100%. This is a block at 100%. Um, uh, of course, you know, once we get rid of this crap, um, then streets can be reclaimed. I mean, this is the largest area in public ownership in the, in the city, street space. We don't need all of that in order to park SUVs. Um, why not do this? You know, why not introduce this? You know, New York City, the most energy efficient in the country, for a second. Uh, and one reason, it's because we've got public transportation and everybody rides on it. So somehow, um, you know, we want to solve this on the supply side by producing food, and we want to solve it on the demand side. So getting back to former points, one of the reasons to have these integrated neighborhoods, you know, we've been walked to school and work, and commerce, and fun, and, and all this, is that it eliminates the need for uh, extensive movement uh, within the city. It becomes much more elective rather than obligatory. Um, 
uh, again, uh, you know, we, we've done a studies of what we call Greenfield. Again, here's a proposition. You have available to you half the street space in New York City to do something. What will it be? Daycare centers, farms, shuffleboards, uh, garden sheds. Um, the possibilities are lim limitless and fabulous. Um, we are working in uh, Manhattanville, a neighborhood study. Probably need a little park space. Um, we certainly don't need this highway space. Uh, and again, um, you know, this, is, th th this is how it could transform. I think it's still New York. -ish. I think it's still bustling, um, but it is supplying itself. Yeah.